Mr. Rauda, take your place, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and all the people. It's a very auspicious occasion for, for and amongst very ordinary people. Um, we from the Academia Library wishes to welcome the author, his work, Welcome to, uh, wish us to welcome heads of academia, heads of, of um, representatives of universities, um, members and of the Tal Rad, members of the Tal Museum represented here today. And we wish to welcome each and everybody watching this live stream um, throughout Africa, throughout Europe, throughout the world right now. We wish you and we welcome you to the live stream book launch um, taking place at the Al Ikhlas Academia Library. The library for all, a public space where things and issues and matters like this takes place. Um, I'm not going to do too much of a delay because I believe we have a very tight program and the program, the day is basically going to be divided into um, the segment of speakers um, up until culminating to the, to, the, to the author and then of course supporting speakers around that which is uh, basically um, heads of academia and representatives of, 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 the, of the museum and Tal Ra, Tal Monument. Then later in the program, there's going to be a handing over of, of um, the book to between the author and, and, and members of the, of the Tal Rad and some other organizations. And then of course, there's a contribution that that needs to be made, a handover that was just um, brought to my attention, and a sort of a ceremony from the Tal Rat in Halabal it's were handig on the Al Ikhlas Bibliotheque. So um, hang in there, and then as we will come, welcome Mr. Ibrahim Roda. Thank you. Who are coming? We believe you were not doing too well. Shukram for coming. Um, the the program of the day is basically um, understanding the author is 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 a complex, very very meticulous person. As as I'm standing here and as he's sitting, he says, "Get on with it. I need to get the book out." <laughs> That's everything. So, um, Muhammad Alexander is a cultural activist. Um, one of his biggest concerns for bringing a work like this to life 
which is not an easy task because with it comes a lot of criticism, with it comes a lot of um, critics out there. Uh, the armchair uh, linguists are all waiting to 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 have their their say. But I think the most important thing is, is um, his concern was to make sure that this type of this type of, of 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 work, this type of language, does not disappear finally from the face of the cobblestones of Bukup and that of the Cape. Um, we are very, very. Uh, it's it's sort of an endangered uh, species at the moment. Uh, the other thing that 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 um, he's been very, very much involved with is um, is the author of the blog, um, the Cape uh, Muslim Vernacular, and uses this blog to raise awareness of of um, of this particular vernacular. So. Um, I personally went, came across it uh, a, a few times, but um, language has never really been my primary concern. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting if something new comes up in the blog. But what was most interesting for me was the fact that he has recorded over 160,000 words. Over 160,000 words has been recorded by any standard or by any accumulation or by any accolade, I would think it is one of the finest achievements that one can for somebody who is doing it as a social activist. And of course, this sort of catches the attention of, of, your, of your mainstream academia. And when I look into the audience here today, I can see um, the, the, the very real, the very interested, interested parties as to why this is uh, such a need um, to preserve. But then the other thing that, um, that, uh, that the book itself, it's a, it's, it's, it's a work seven years in, 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 in the making. And there's no way that you you can take seven years and just put it aside. And the culmination of that book, and I don't think it's all because when we discussed the 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 follow-up of the book, and his main concern was to get through this one. We'll deal with the follow-up at a later stage, but the main concern was this one. The main concern of the follow-up of the book, a follow-up of the book was the fact that the contesting of whatever words could be in there and perhaps if other people could come up with, you know, co-words or anything like that, and then that would create a follow-up as to what needs to be corrected and so on. The last chapter of the book is about Arabic Afrikaans and this chapter he hopes to revive the defunct writing system of the earlier Muslims. And that is that is a, a a task that I think not only monumental, but it's it's it, it's something that I'll be waiting for. I don't know if I'm going to um, hand over to you now and 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 do the introduction to Imam Harun, uh, to Professor Harun later, or would you walk into the to the introduction of the of the of the book yourself. Okay, so 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 um, that gives me a chance to to have a dialogue with uh, with Prof now in 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 your business here. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm handing you over to the author uh, Muhammad Alexander. Give him a hand. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everyone here. First, I'd like to thank um, Al Ikhlas Academia Library for this perfect venue. My good friend here, Suleiman Omar, who assisted me with the planning of this event, our distinguished professor, Muhammad Harun. And 
my other colleagues here, Muhammad Kamikamadin and uh, my other friend, <laughs> Umar, Suleyma, uh, Umar Amir, who assisted me with the book. He's also the author of the book. Also, like to, I'm so glad my, one of the members of the Taurad is here. And also, my other friend, Hilmi Hartley, who has been on this journey with me since day one. And of course, um, everyone here who has taken the time out to be here today. Thank you very much. If I can give a short backstory to this book, you know, a few years ago, my colleague and I had a difference of opinion on the meaning of some of the older Malay words and or Malay words used by previous generations. And of course, the year in which we live today, whenever we need a quick answer, we Google. And that's what we did. I wanted to find that Google was actually more ignorant than we were on these words. And we were quite surprised to find that nobody took it upon themselves to compile a detailed word list of all the foreign loan words in the Cape Muslim vernacular. Because this is so important, we find um, across the globe, so many languages are becoming extinct as their native speakers die. So many societies have lost their, their cultures, their languages, and even their histories. So many interesting cultures are slowly dying out to this day. And this should be our concern too. Therefore, my colleague and I decided that we're going to take up this task to compile a dictionary like this. Of course, with the help of the community, especially elders in our community, we also had a young gentleman who is a uh, from the University of, of Indonesia. He is a, a linguist, a uh, master student in linguistics at the University of Indonesia. So it was quite a group effort, and to the general community, we have to, I'd like to say, a heartfelt shukran, tramakasi, for their contribution towards this book. But to give a short summary of the book, you see, this book deals with the Afrikaans of the Cape Muslims. The Afrikaans used by Cape Muslims when they interact with each other differs from the Afrikaans they use when speaking to a non-Cape Muslim. Because the Afrikaans spoken by Cape Muslims differs significantly from the, from the Afrikaans spoken by non-Muslims. And the reason for this is because there are so many foreign loan words in the Cape Muslim Afrikaans. For example, there are so many Malay words, words such as Tamav, Kanala, Tramakasi, Puaza, Buka, Labarang, Tsumbain, Bacha, Puzis. What else is there? Maningal, Tulis. Then there are also many Arabic loan words in the Cape Muslim vernacular. Of course, the common words I can think of now is Khasat, Khilaf, Fitna, Kibr, Munafik, Hamil, Zanaza, Sukran, Nika, and so many other. Arabic loan words in the Cape Muslim vernacular. Then there are also many self-created Afrikaans words. Afrikaans words the Cape Muslims inherited from their forebears. Afrikaans words used by Cape Muslims not found in the standard Afrikaans dictionaries. For example, we talk about Slumps School, Copless, Copless Book, Khujazis, Ha'ata, and so many other words. But it's not only these foreign loan words and, foreign and all these unique Afrikaans words used by Cape Muslims that makes Cape Muslim Afrikaans different to other versions of Afrikaans. It's a complete different language culture. For example, there are so many Afrikaans idiomatic expressions used and understood exclusively by Cape Muslims. For example, we talk about only the Cape Muslim know the true meanings behind these idiomatic expressions. Then, of course, there are also many 
exclamations used exclusively by Cape Muslim. We talk about inshallah, mashallah, subhanallah, inshallah. Wa inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Alhamdulillah is a sigh of relief. These exclamations are used exclusively by Cape Muslim. And I say exclusively because there are also family names. Ummi, Bia, Ami, Amati, Khalati, Ukhti, Abi, Abuya, Atta. These family names, family titles, terms of endearment, terms of respect for the elders, are used exclusively by Cape Muslim. It's a complete different language culture. Greeting terms, assalamu alaikum, answer wa alaikum salam. Saying thank you, shukran, answer afwan. Some use the word jazakallah, may Allah reward you. Jazakallah khair, may Allah reward you with goodness. A complete different language culture. If someone else asks, how are you? You'd say fine, thank you. When it's Muslim to Muslim, the answer is alhamdulillah. All praises, thank you, used Allah. The Afrikaans used by Cape Muslim when they interact with each other is completely different to the Afrikaans used when they speak to a non-Cape Muslim. It's a complete different version of Afrikaans. In the book, we give a typical example of a conversation between two Cape Muslims to show how different Cape Muslim Afrikaans is compared to other versions of Afrikaans. And it goes something like this. Of course, the whole conversation is about a four page long, but I'll just give the first few lines. So I met a friend of mine and I invited him to go to a function with me. We spoke in Afrikaans and he declined the invitation saying, Niman, ik zal ik gaan niman. Ik ga naar Gaza, 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 and Can you hear the difference? Due to these words, the Cape Muslim will sit here and listen to this whole conversation, follow this whole conversation without even realizing that so many words were used only to his or her understanding. In contrast, due to these foreign loan words, Cape Muslim Afrikaans is not always understandable to non-Cape Muslims. And this is the purpose of this book, to introduce this version of Afrikaans to the rest of the Afrikaans speaking community and the rest of South Africa. Because very few non-Cape Muslims knows about this version of Afrikaans, very few. And the reason they don't know, as I mentioned earlier, the Cape Muslim will use this version of Afrikaans when they interact with each other. But the moment they turn and speak to a non-Cape Muslim, we subconsciously replace all these Afrikaans with in their lex Afrikaans lexicon with the equivalent English or Afrikaans word. So I feel the time has come for us now to share this private language the Cape Muslims have been using for more than a century now. I have to say something. There are, however, some non Cape Muslims who regularly co mingle with Muslims who knows some of these words and they will use these words to communicate with their Muslim friends. But the number of words our non-Cape Muslim friends know will vary from person to person. But at least with this dictionary now, our non-Muslim friends now have the option they can learn all these words with meanings to better communicate with their Muslim friends, colleagues, and neighbors. So then as for also, the, the wordless, in the wordless, we give the word, the meaning, as well as the origins of the word. So that's even better for those who do research, perhaps. And then, of course, um, the last chapter in the book is on Arabic Afrikaans. Um, and with this chapter, like, as you mentioned, we are, uh, the purpose of this chapter is uh, an attempt to try and revive this writing system. For those who do not know what Arabic Afrikaans is, Arabic Afrikaans is a writing system used by previous earlier Muslims where they use the Arabic script to write in Afrikaans. So that's the last chapter in the book. So 
I hope that this book will be well received. And on the last page of the book, there's an email address where we ask people to give feedback. So on the word, if you feel my Umi, my Bia, my Ami, Amati, Khalati, all the deal of the word gebruik, let us know. Then we can add it to an also the first chapter of the book is on the language culture of the Cape Muslims. So if you feel that there's something we should have added to the language culture of science, let us know there's an email address. So hopefully the next edition, you will have a more inclusive and hopefully a super dictionary and super book on the language culture of the Cape Muslim. So inshallah, we'll be waiting on that. And for that, I'll just say shukran, jazakallah, and bayat ramakasi. inshallah. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, uh, by Krishlam say, say from me that uh, Ami moet the right English word. As a host, I feel much relieved because my author is relaxed. You'll never believe the amount of tension one gets under when you when you when you MC a an event and you have your author and your guests looking at you and get on with it. Get on with it. I'm not a fast speaker. I do things slowly. That was a I think it was it was it was a no, let me rephrase this. We've, we've far too long been in, a, in an environment of the, consumation, uh, the consumption of knowledge rather than the production of knowledge. Um, I don't want to differ with uh, ID Duplessy on this platform over the editor of the cut about Bhubuti or anything, but I think the 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 whole question of 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 this book of this vernacular is about who does the Bhutti belong to, and I'll go on record to say that it belongs to us, this hybrid society in the southern tip of Africa, where we are collective and a connection of each and everything that was in us. Earlier on, we were speaking we were speaking about the person inquired how do you manage to bring two languages two languages into one and talk with it we have the adhan of asr i feel we're just gonna take a break just a moment and once the adhan is completed then we will continue the other thing is this we will have we will make the um the facility available um when we're gonna do the walk of asr um, a little bit, a little bit later. Just a little bit later. Um, we were discussing mother, but I'm not going to go on record and on YouTube discussing mother at an event that I that I'm that I'm hosting because I might find myself in deep salt water. So just give it about five minutes. Um, just let the call of prayer uh, be completed, and then we will continue. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Academia Library. Um, the People's Library, a library for all based in Lansdowne, Cape Town, South Africa. We, we want to welcome um, our online viewers from up in Africa. Europe, Australia, and I think uh, US. Um, as I was saying, that yeah, that was that. Uh, thank you to the to the to the author of the book for giving us um, such a beautiful. You you were extremely passionate. You did, I don't think you should tonight. You should take the roll the tape back. And then you can see how passionate you've become and you were just out there. But thank you for the contribution. We've become, we've, we, we, I think we were people of just merely consumers of knowledge um, up until the time. Now we've become um, producers of knowledge. Um, and it's not just via mainstream academia. It is speaking to the the person who, who, who's a vendor with fruit and vegetables, but he can tell you exactly this winter is not going to be a good winter for for our grounded um, vegetables because the ground is going to become too cold. That to me was very, very, very impressive. And the man did not even study agriculture. He's just been selling vegetables for the last 50 years. The so next speaker is needs no introduction, but um, in terms of protocols observed, must be introduced. And uh, Professor Muhammad um, Harun used to be attached to the University of Botswana's uh, Theology and Religious Studies Department. So um, whenever I see Professor Harun, I would think that he's back in town for about two weeks. He's become the professor of two weeks in my life, and then he's off again. Um, professor is currently um, a senior researcher for a Cape Town-based uh, Al Jamaa party and associate researcher for the University of Stellenbosch. Um, Prof, I'd just like you to rectify anything if I say, say anything out of context or if I say anything wrong. So please. Um, if I just uh, rectify me there. At present, Prof. Um, Harun edits University of Cape Town's annual review, annual review of Islam in Africa, ARIA, and is also the editor-in-chief um, of Duke University's Research Africa Reviews. Now, the, the, the one question that, that, that begs to be asked is that should we have people of, of, of this magnitude, scholars of this magnitude in our midst, why are we not utilizing them? So Professor Harun, um, prepare yourself because Academia Library will be calling and knocking on your door um, for your wisdom and guidance in the near future, inshallah. So uh, what Prof will be doing is basically put into sort of context um, uh, sort of a linguistic context as to as to whether for, for the formulation of um, uh, Muhammad uh, Alexander's book, and then also a reflection on the Malayo Arabic, Afrikaans Arabic, social historical transformation of the language, and then um, how 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 the language gained traction into into from just mere speaking into reading, into writing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to that's gonna be the, um, the, uh, uh, the job of, of Professor Harun. Without further ado, um, can we put your hand together for Prof Harun and may his, his, his speech and may his lecture educate us. Shukran.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir amri wa hlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to Muhammad. Thanks for extending this invitation. I was not supposed to be here. Somebody else was supposed to be here, but due to circumstances, things have changed. And as we would say, qada wa qadar, as it is fate that this has to be. Thank you, Mr. MC, for your kind introduction. Let me basically just try to share with you my own thoughts and reaction to Muhammad Alexander's book. Like the MC indicated that at one stage in our sort of uh, collective life, we have been consumers of knowledge. In other words, others have been writing and we have been reading and basically digesting the ideas, internalizing them, but in the process of doing that, questioning what are we consuming? For whom are we consuming? Why are we doing so? So in other words, it basically forced us to critically respond and think about these because after all, what is this whole process about? It's about identity formation. On the one hand, as a community in the Cape, of course, spread out now all over the world, in Australia and Canada and elsewhere, the Cape Muslims have always been grappling with their identity. And Hilmi, Hartley and I, we were just talking earlier about the issue of some basically wanting to impose a particular identity on us. But as we basically respond to that, the issue is that identity is something fluid. Although there are some commonality or there's a uh, dimension that keeps us, so to speak, rooted on earth, but there's also other aspects that flourish in, in a way that we take on different identities. And this is basically something that we cannot overlook. Having said that, I think this book that Muhammad had presented to us and which we hope we will be enjoying as we sort of go through it, is also an issue of identity. Because looking back at language, because after all, language is dynamic and identities are dynamic, so the two come together. You, sometimes I think we should close our eyes and go back into the 18th century, 19th century. And just imagine we were Twanguru, or we were uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi, or we were one of those individuals from that sort of era. What went through our minds when we were busy trying to pen ideas that we had memorized or that we were speaking onto paper? So we think about Twanguru's compendium, Ma'rif uh, al-Islam, as we know it as. And so you can imagine the circumstance under which it was written and penned. And then we go decades later, we come and we meet Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi. And he also decides to use his Kurdish, Turkish background theological understanding as a Hanafi coming into Shafi territory and making sense of this community and then writing these particular texts. And in between, we have many other texts that we have not mentioned, partly because attention has been given to these. And I want to quickly just briefly talk about these texts that are in between, that are not necessarily lost, fortunately, because they are a number of manuscripts, and if you go to Ahmad David's writings, he said there were 75. But if you look at the catalogs that were written, there are two catalogs, very important catalogs, which ironically has been done by, I say ironical part because it should have been done by us in South Africa, not by others from outside South Africa. But be that as it may, there were two important catalogs that were written or were, were sort of prepared. The one was by Munazza, um, Hajj Munazza. She's a librarian at, uh, at, 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 um, at the National Library in, in Malaysia. This was in the 1990s. And then along came another uh, scholar. I'm just trying to get to his name for now. Uh, and he compiled another set in 2008. So between 1998 and, 19, uh, and 2008, 10 years apart, another catalog. Interestingly, 
the commonality between the two catalogs that there were certain families whom the two had interviewed and listed. But the interesting part of the 2008 one reflected what? It reflected that there were much more or many more manuscripts than what we seem to have thought. In other words, 75, it's jumped to 114. You can imagine this jump. And what does this sort of basically mean? It means that, unfortunately, there has been many others that were lost in the process with time, burning of the manuscript, uh, and for whatever other re uh, reason. But the point is that these manuscripts were part of our identity, were part of our history, it's part of our legacy, it's part of our heritage that we unfortunately have forgotten or skimmed over or take for granted, so to speak. In other words, okay, yeah, I had heard that he had that book, gehad, and I know what he had made. And in a case, in fact, I was told orally by somebody else, when Sheikh Ahmad Bihadin passed away, many of his books were in the yard, either being destroyed or in the process of being destroyed. How true that is, I don't know, but the point of the matter is if that is the case, and it's so sad when you hear some of these stories, and apparently there are many such stories. But having said that, and I think having, and I want to quickly just talk about the, as we had mentioned, the, so we want to talk about the linguistic changes. Of course, the early, our forebears were basically Malayu speakers. And as a result, they did not speak Afrikaans at the time. And so, of course, even though the Dutch might have basically been a colonized uh, sort of uh, power, they basically transferred these communities to the Cape. And so the Malayu basically was the connecting language. But in the process of doing that, we find, of course, the, as you get to mix with the locals, you get new ideas, you get new uh, vocabulary, you change the language. And so it is of interest to find that the manuscripts that have been found at the early period were many were Malayo manuscripts, Malayo Arab, or what they call Ajami manuscripts. And so there are a number of those that we hope, and in fact, I was talking to Muta Kinelian, and I was glad to hear that his daughter is studying uh, in Indonesia, and my concern is she should be specializing in Bahasa, Indonesia. The one reason for that is so at least we can have our own basically going into these manuscripts, in other words, armed with this language and understanding what was written and what had been written. So at least that dimension, in other words, to fill the gaps, the linguistic gaps. So we need many more. Of course, his daughter is just one of them. There are others who have gone, but might not have gone into the language as such. And so we would like to encourage our young to basically go uh, along that pathway because I think it's a necessary one at this point in time because after all, studying these manuscripts is one important way to basically get an understanding of the past. At the same time, it's also getting an understanding of the religious ideas that have been sort of flowing, uh, circulating, and how these ideas have influenced the thinking of our forebears and what they have been sharing. So that dimension is, but as we see, I mean, if we look back at the 18th century into the 19th century, what happens in, by the 19th century? Afrikaans becomes sort of an important language. But then many did not realize that these, um, this emerging or the growing Cape Muslim community basically was using Afrikaans, but using the Arabic script to transfer the ideas. And that in itself was innovative, it was creative. And they did it with a passion, like Muhammad did with a passion doing his thing. And I think maybe I should just say as a part of the footnote, anyone who does research and who does things with passion will eventually produce something very important for the community, not for him or herself, but for the community at large, because it helps to give us a better understanding of the language, uh, the history of the language, the socio-linguistic dimension of the language, and other aspects. So by the 19th century then, we find another set of literature emerging. Ahmad Davids, of course, in fact, there was a debate in 1989 between Ahmad Davids and another uh, scholar uh, at, at Rao, at, of course, 
Latin Africans University at the time, raising the question whether the, what they said, Qawl al-Mateen or Qawl al-Mateen, as we know it, the Qawl al-Mateen is a text written in Arabic Afrikaans, printed at the Cape, whether that was the first text. Of course, Ahmed David basically argued that that was the first printed text. But with the catalogs, I think we can go further back a number of other texts, but we're not going to go into that for this particular forum. But the point which I want to make is that it was fascinating just to see, and again, we have to pay tribute to Ahmad Davids for really raising the bar in the debates, raising the issues of language, raising the issue of who claims the language, raising sort of the issue of the language itself, the evolution of the language. And I think his contribution cannot, you know, we, one cannot in any way overlook it. Any uh, sort of language historian has to bring Ahmad into the discussion. But prior to him, interestingly, again, it's not insiders with outsiders, although one can say they became insiders. And here we think of and pay tribute to Adrianus van Selems. There's no way where we can say that, well, it started with Ahmad Davids. It started at some earlier point. In addition to him having contributed, we're not going to go into the contribution he made, but I mean, his name is associated with the uh, discussion on Arabic Afrikaans. The other is the German scholar, uh, Hans, um, sorry? Yeah, Hans Keller. Hans Keller basically did some interesting studies, which unfortunately is out of reach to many of us because it's in German. And hopefully somebody will make an effort to translate them into English or Afrikaans. The point which I want to make is that Hans Keller also had an important, made important interventions, uh, intellectual interventions. I think these are important sort of uh, issues that we need to bear in mind. But they reflected also on, the, on Arabic Afrikaans as it sort of emerged. They did not really study the Malayu texts uh, that we are. So we, life has been given to Ar Afrikaans, intellectual life, so to speak, through their writings. But before we come to Muhammad's sort of text, again, I want to also mention Ernest uh, Kotsir. I think Ernest has done wonderful work too. And unfortunately, uh, his um, compilation that uh, he has, I'm, I'm not certain what the dates were, maybe you might know uh, uh, when he basically compiled a list of, 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 of Arabic, um, of, well, wow. Arabic Afrikaans words, again, I, I want to change that sort of label somewhat, partly because it sometimes can be confusing, but be that as the point is that he has a list, which I think I shared with uh, you, Muhammad, which I think is also very interesting, exciting, because he has one scholar who delved into and tried to make sense of some of these. So, and this is where Muhammad's uh, contribution comes in. I think with hindsight, and when we look back at the changes that have taken place. Muhammad come, I think, maybe maybe at the right time, if one can describe it that way. Because nobody else has really done that, apart from the uh, short text that Ernest has, 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 has done. Ahmad Davids, of course, has been writing about Arabic Afrikaans, but collecting them has unfortunately not been on their agenda. And this is where Muhammad Alexander's work comes in. He has made an, sort of an effort really to bring in all of these concepts and terms and ideas, and I think, make sense of them. And of course, to make sense of them is also very difficult. It's no easy task. It's a tedious one. But it's a very um, sort of, it, it's one that one can feel sort of uh, very joyous about. In what sense? In a sense that here is somebody who decided to channel all his energies to just look at whatever he could lay his hands on that contributed to the language formation. And in the process of doing that, maybe putting his and his co-authors' ideas into perspective. And so in a sense, what it does now, it basically put us on the map, literally and figuratively. In other words, now we can at least see in a text what, which words have been used, why have they disappeared? And of course, as we talk about these things, we must also bear in mind, being in the period that we are in, the issue of Arabization, for example, has affected us quite deeply. 
from the 1960s, 70s, 80s onwards. And then on top of that, the issue of Islamization. These are conceptual processes that impacted upon communities, not necessarily at the Cape, but worldwide. And of course, we're not going to go into the spin-offs of these, but the point which I want to make is that when we look at the um, evolution of the language, it has to also be seen within these processes. So prior to this Arabization, this is exactly what Muhammad Alexander has been doing, listing all of these and putting them into that. So we must look back prior to the dying out of these, because basically it's, it's literally, literally dying out. I mean, if I talk to my kids, they don't understand some of the, I mean, what Muhammad had been told as he, when he spoke earlier on. They wouldn't know what you are saying. It's like foreign to the ears. And this is part of the problem that we have not seen to try to conserve it. We didn't try to preserve it. We didn't try to basically share it. And this is what is necessary. And so his intervention in this regard becomes important. We cannot overlook it. It is somewhere within the system. And so at least now we can say there's a book that captures all of these. And I think this is, and I think what uh, the MC said earlier, and yes, of course, we will have critics, the armchair ones, the, the lounge ones, the you know bedroom ones, uh, and you'll get all sorts of them. But let's look at the contribution that has been there. I think that is critical to us. And this contribution that Muhammad made and has made, and that we have in our hands now, of course, I haven't yet, but the point of the matter is, it is an important contribution from a purely linguistic dimension, from a language dimension, from an identity dimension, from a heritage dimension. I mean, we can look at it at different levels, but it's all of these put together that we need to see his particular contribution. And so, Having said all of that, and let me conclude because I don't want to keep you more than, I mean, and I can sit and talk to you more about many of these things because they are so fascinating. In other words, our identity is a fascinating identity. That's the reason why Fan Salams basically studied uh, partly our community and the text. That is the reason why other scholars have come to South Africa to look at who is this Cape Muslim community. It's because of what we have contributed. And of course, our contribution, as we all know by now, did not just was not only in language or in linguistics, but in the culinary sector. I mean, the Cape Malay tradition of food making is uh, known and has become part of our identity. The building industry, and, and sadly, we don't have many who have written on the building industry, on the history of the Cape building industry, because that is where our forebears have also made a tangible contribution. Your carpenters, your bricklayers, your builders, I mean, you can name them, uh, 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 impact they have made. But unfortunately, unlike this language one where we need to have something tangible to latch onto, there hasn't been anything written on that sector of our, our community. Just to demonstrate that contributions were made at different levels in different ways at different times. And I think all of these have to be acknowledged, despite the shortcomings of our community. Yes, we have shortcomings. We, we're not a perfect community. But through those shortcomings, we complemented one another's strength. And as a result of that complementary processes, we basically produce what we, what we have. So yes, we are, to basically round off, we are in an age of now producing. And so, there are a number of individuals who have been making their com contributions. Like your radio stations, a totally new area since 1990s have now made their contribution, made it sort of you know, through cyberspace. So whether our family members or relative or extended family live in Australia or New Zealand or Canada or the UK, they all can tune in and are tuning in. But this is also, in other words, when you think about community radio stations, they have made an impact. And so one can go on as to at what levels we basically have people who have made a mark, but whose contribution has not as yet been recognized. And that is why we would encourage our young researchers to basically do so. Look at the um, sort of 
rugby sector, look at soccer, look at cricket, and we're talking about specifically the sort of uh, certain uh, sporting codes where Muslims have made a, a contribution. So we look forward to these, but let me come back and just end with this. I think, Muhammad, what you have done was a passion. You have done us a great service. Uh, you, will, you have contributed to our language understanding in a different way. In other words, our understanding of language was maybe uh, in one sort of one dimensional, but now we can latch on to seeing that this language has really grown out of a number of inputs at different times. When we're talking about the uh, issue of pujis, for example, it's a Sanskrit word uh, that ultimately landed up uh, in the Indonesian language. So there's this other dimension to the language dynamics as well when you look at the etymologies of these languages. But I'm just giving that particular one word, but what it shows that there has been this dynamism. And what you have done now is to put this language and specifically these phrases and this uh, understanding of the language in a particular context that we can have a better understanding of who we are and how our forebears have contributed to this and how we can further take this into the future. And I think this is where our language planners, and particularly our South African language planners, where the notion that Afrikaans should basically uh, disappear, I think there's this notion in some quarters, unfortunately, that Afrikaans, you know, it's, it's a dying language. But I think the longer we continue to speak it and communicate and write in it, I think we remain a dynamic one. And let us try to hold on to it and to share that with our next generation of children so that, and of course society, so that they can appreciate the different identities that exist within our nation because we complement one another. We, do, we are not against any other identities. We should open and warmly welcome others because in that way, the notion of Ubuntu is given that understanding that we are basically here because of you. In other words, this notion of love thy neighbor from purely religious dimension. In other words, we love thy neighbor, of course, not the romantic love, but uh, love thy neighbor in a, in a very spirited way that we appreciate one another and accept one another for who we are and collectively move ahead with what we have. On that note, thank you very much. And Muhammad, uh, again, Tramakasi for your contribution and may many other writings emerge from your desk. Thank you. So. <clears throat> I think, pro thank you, Professor Haran. You have crossed the unenviable Rubicon in terms of putting it into perspective. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. I said earlier on, somebody asked me, how do you guys do it to put an English and an Afrikaans word in one sentence and make it sound so normal. And I asked for an example, like, you know, and I realized what she was talking about, like, um, as uh, also so partnery event, but uh, Archie had organized that the yellow event would her reorganize with, in accordance to. So say, how do you people do that? How do you? How do you do that? I speak German and I only speak German. I don't speak German and something else was German. Or well, I speak English and it's only English. How do you do it? I, 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 and it's only in Cape Town where this thing is done, where you organize your uh, reinvention, funny organization, and so on and so on and so on. Um, my answer to her was you have to be flexible. On the one hand, you had the the boers of the apartheid regime on your back. And on the other hand, you had the English also not taking kindly. And if you woke up, you're completely missing. But yeah, 
it is just something that is Cape Town, and I think Professor uh, Professor Harun has, has has beautifully beautifully stated that. I'm going to open up for. Can everybody hear me? Uh, it's, yeah, I'm going to open up for a few questions, and if you want to dispute the book, call a meeting. There's the man. <laughs> Take him on and 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 but there's a whole whole of people here today. So we want to give everybody um I see you, I see you, relax, I see you, I see you. Uh we have a whole whole of people here today. It's a beautiful turnout. It's a beautiful turnout. The ethos of academia is exactly this. that we do not discern as to what is more important to discuss academically and what was created by some uh, uh, social activists as less important. It is something on the table that needs a discussion, that needs introduction. Yesterday, a lady walked in here. Her first book she made was a, was of a photocopy machine from her library. Yesterday, she walked in here, boasting with her first publication by the British uh, Children's uh, Publishing House Cube. Her book, will be, her book will be launched at the Academia um, in time to come, inshallah. That is what I am talking about. We, have, we are becoming producers of knowledge on the southern tip of Africa. And yet we are very ordinary people, very ordinary people. So I'm going to open up for questions and answers. If you decide to take on the author in a controversial way, I ask you, do not do that. You see the gentlemen at the back, they are the bouncers. Not you, you are the bouncers. <laughs> they will be, anyway. So, um, Preface your your question with 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 your with 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 as Professor you as topang as possible. Um, I am I am then going to then. Um, we have the editor of the book in the house as well. Exactly. I think before we do any before we do anything else. People, let me put you into context when you pick up a book. If that book wasn't edited, <laughs> ask Mr. Yusuf Daniels at the back. People will laugh at you. It won't be a lecker read. People will laugh at you. And it's these people like our editors who does cross-reading, constant cross-reading and still find a fault, and constant cross-reading and still find a fault. So I'm, asking, I'm going to ask the editor of the book, please come to the front and say a few words. When, when, when we spoke about the launch of this book, um, Muhammad and I spoke about at length about this, about this book. And he said, um, he said, Naiman, a smart, a, a sit. 15 minutes to talk, 10 minutes to talk, and a few days I got a lot of slangers and bats and do good things. It's all organized, it's organized, it's organized. I said, this is not one of those works, believe me. The content of your book, I've been launching books for a very long time, over a decade. The content of your book will not allow you for 10, 15 minutes. It's not going to allow you. So we are going to go, we are going to do justice to the launch oskari book oskari book properly ikaram properly understand <laughs> so 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 um with with that with that being said please another hand over a round of applause for the author for the editor Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil musarin Sayyidina wa nabiyyana wa ala muhammad Wa salamu ala ashrafil musarin Rabbi salah liya sadri wa rasili Amalai wa kata Can you hear me everyone? Yeah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, I can't actually wait to hear what I'm going to say <laughs> In the case uh, My name is Umar Amir Nadkar um, but apart, I just decided to be Umar Amir. Um, I'm the editor of the of the book of Muhammad. Uh, can I have a copy quickly? Yeah, one copy quickly. Anyone? No. Is there one here? Sugar. Okay, so nobody's held up the copy for everyone to see. That's the book. Okay. And my job was to edit, basically. Um, um, first of all, uh, Professor, I'm delighted to meet you again. You will not remember me, but we were children together. Okay. <laughs> um, I, used, I used to live in Claremont, and your late dad, um, Almarhum, a Shahid. Abdullah, Rao, uh, Abdullah Harun was my imam, as Tehman wrote, and also the best of Pujis Habak. Niman can Pujis Habak, it's also city. And to those who are the standard Afrikaans speakers, Pujis Habak has got nothing to do with baking. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Any guys. Uh, but I'm also delighted to have assisted uh, Muhammad in the, some of the research of the book. And uh, um, in the uh, the first part of the book deals with how the how the Dutch slaves were brought to the Cape, and how the uh, language evolved. And his little it was a little hobby with him, which uh, evolved into a wildfire passion for Muhammad and eventually culminated in the publishing of the book. Well done, Muhammad. I think give him a hand. This is actually well done. The press wants me to hold up the book again. Here we are. OK. So uh, it, it deals with the um, Yes, how how the Dutch brought the the, um, um, the uh, slaves to the Cape, how the language slowly evolved, the um, Malay words that were retained after the time as the as the language evolved into Afrikaans, and uh, he dealt with many of the words, labarang, kaparang, jamang. The one I loved was a palang. You know, some of these words, they have that idiomatic force, you know? Subhanallah, da balanga. Now, the standard Afrikaans speaker will, no, won't understand what that means. Do you know, do you understand what it means? Khlatni, no? In any case, so it, it gives a little, a, a, a humorous swing to it as well, you know? Uh, the guy goes with the motorcycle. So what what impression do you get? Motorcycle against a tree and a guy hanging over a branch like that. Yeah, that. That's the sort of thing. A lot of these words have that swing to it. Uh, when I read through the words, you get Milaya and Medora. I heard these words. Never knew the difference between the two. Afterwards, uh, I asked my wife, in fact, and she said, the one is longer than the other one. I still don't know which, but there you go. You know, and I think the book deals with how many? 500 words are in there. My sister-in-law helped me. Well, she's a Arabic teacher as well. She assisted me with some of the words. You know, The second part of the book deals with the... the uh, um, Muslim Afrikaans, how he uh, describes, he distinguishes between 
like a, the example I gave, Muslim Afrikaans and um, the standard Afrikaans. Um, and there are many examples that he, uh, dem that he demonstrates in the book of uh, the Muslim Afrikaans, where the, uh, the amazing thing is when a Muslim Afrikaner um, speaks to, when they converse with each other, okay, they'll understand what they are saying. When the um, standard Afrikaans speaker, he listens to them, you won't understand like the example I just gave you now. But when the Muslim Afrikaner speaks to the standard Afrikaner, he can code switch and he does it unconsciously because he knows he's got to speak a language that you've got to understand. But you can't do likewise. You understand? You won't be able to do likewise. So he makes that distinction that Muslim Afrikaans is different. It's different from the standard Afrikaans. And that's the second part. So <clears throat> I sit there and he gives me all this work. And he says to the, well, he did the research all the research, he puts all this work, his hard work in there, and he hands it to me and he says, now you write it in your flowery language. <laughs> he says, so okay, that's, that's my job. I've got to write it in flowery language. So that's what you're reading, basically. And I will have done two or three pages and he'll phone me and say, and says to me, um, Umar, how far did you get? It's only a day, you know. Yeah, but I've changed it again. Uh, oh, 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 right. Email it to me. I'll have to start all over again. And he emails it to me and I start all over again. The next day he phones me and says, how far did you get? Uh, I said, it's only been a day. Yeah, I've changed it again. But this is the nature of authors. They will, won't be satisfied until they are satisfied. They'll change it every day. They'll, after writing 10 pages, they'll change it again. And then they'll change it again. But that's my job. Then I've just, I've just got to go with it. And that's how it went until eventually the book was finished. And when the book was finished, I asked him, is it published? Yes, but I did a few changes. I said, no, you're not going to do this. Send it back to me, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll, I'll, I'll edit it again. This is exactly the nature of authors. I'm an author myself. Um, so that's the second part, what, what I deal with. The second part was uh, with the, uh, the Afrikaans. The okay. third, third part was um, <clears throat> uh, in those days, in the 1940s, the Second World War, up to even 1960s, most Muslims were illiterate. They, the one thing they could do was they could read Arabic. Right? They could read Arabic. They couldn't read Afrikaans or the Roman uh, script. They could read Arabic. So when they wrote Afrikaans, they, sp they were Afrikaans speaking. But they wrote Afrikaans in Arabic script. So now here's an amazing feat. Um, there was a gentleman called Butahanif Johadin. We lived in Hyde Street in District 6 at the time. He translated 26 uh, surahs of the Quran into Afrikaans using Arabic script. Okay? And, and there's a photograph at the back here, huh? somewhere. If I can have a snapshot of it. It's actually an amazing thing I've done. Can't seem to get to it. Is it still in here? Right at the back. Ah, no, not here. Here it is. Okay, I don't know. I don't think you'll be able to see it from there. 
I don't think you'll be able to see it from there. <laughs> but you'll think it's the Quran, you'll think it's Arabic, but it's not Arabic, it's Afrikaans actually. So how they did it, I, I tried to decipher it, I managed to decipher some of it. If you say ek hit, then how do you write ek in Arabic? So you use both fatha and kasra. So you can't say ah or i, you got to join the two, you get eh. Right? So you get ek. And you add a kaf and you get ek. So you'll take the urdu. Urdu P, which is the bar with the three dots at the bottom, you know that will be your P because there are lots of consonants not that's not in the in the Arabic. You'll take uh, the Fa and it'll add two dots, make a three dots at the top, and that becomes your V. And that's the way they wrote it. Okay, I'll end it off now. And okay, so that's how they did it. So, well done, Muhammad. And inshallah, we may do all that this book will be a success and that there will be many more to come, inshallah. Amen. Okay. Uh, but Omar, before you go home, I thought you gave this book to me. <laughs> I wish. Um, before you leave, Uncle, uh, Uncle Omar, I would love to speak to you before you, inshallah, afterwards. I will now open the floor for um, questions. One moment. Um, come, to cl come, come as close as possible to the front because we need the microphone and, of course, our camera technical people at the back, they will need. So, yeah, that's close enough. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Buta Muhammad, shukran. This is wonderful. Uh, we wouldn't have missed it for the world. Uh, Professor, wonderful to see you in person. I was just asking uh, Yusuf Daniels at the back there, do I really have to flower everything because I can tell us for dining. <laughs> so when we actually present what it is that we want as a community, and I loved what you were saying about the Muslimness and also and Iqab, how do we not lose that flavor if, for example, we're doing academic writing? And I think that's our challenge. We want to keep it up there with whoever is supposed to read it, but we don't want to lose the essence. So how do we actually merge the two? How do I become an academic writer or researcher without losing the character of my people, but I also want to not get a bad grade? Um, how do I merge the two? Shall Professor answer that now? Okay, um, I've got I've got a question in the front, and then two, and we'll line up another two or three. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Just want to know, with the arrival of Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi at the Cape in the 1860s, how did he differ? How did he communicate from the word go when he arrived? I believe he was only a uh, welcome the second day when he arrived here. So I, I just want to know why is there uh, Turkish words within the book? And why, uh, what, what happened during that time? And maybe the author can maybe explain. Thank you. A third question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the question I have is, is one, two. Hello. Okay, it's working. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good. Good afternoon to everyone here. Um, uh, shukran, uh, congratulations on this book. Uh, it's my birthday today, and um, I also know that there's something specifically happened to Imamara on the 28th of May. I can't remember correctly what it is. Um, and uh, we'd like to ask uh, Allah to grant uh, Imamara and all whom a chant of those, inshallah, amen. Um, I was fortunate to grow up in the 70s. Um, so in the 70s, kid, I you know, was exposed to all this language. Uh, my children, though, aren't. So I, my question is, um, how could you 
uh, possibly approach the government and also all the various organizations to actually bring this book, you know, to the youth really, and that we kind of bring it back into our um, homes. Uh, it's a beautiful language and it's like the secret code. So I don't know about everyone else here, but we used to speak potato language uh, at Sari Primary. And so it was actually interesting. Um, I don't think I could do that now. So, you know, if you don't give this back to the our, in our families and actually use like merang and kaparang and I mean, it's just a fit and I think people had a certain language and it's a secret code as well. So maybe uh, we could actually expose our kids to this, inshallah. I mean, that's... My question, Shukran. Prof. Um, to Muhammad, the first. Um, as for the last question, um, the lady asked there, you see, our forebears did their duty to preserve our culture for us. The task of preserving our culture now falls on us. It is now our duty to instill in our children a sense of pride for our culture, for our traditions. I was, yeah, you're going to have to keep our cuts alive. We're going to have to keep our history alive. Nobody else is going to do it for us. So we, whenever we speak to our children, we use all these terms instead of the Western alternatives. And that is why how we and we pass it over to the next generation. Instead of saying please and thank you, we say shukran, kanala, and all these terms. And not only the, the, the Western alternatives. And this is how we keep the language alive. I hope that answers your question. Um, it's what, I don't think I have any Turkey's words unless you you can show me. Uh, I don't think I have mostly Malay and Arabic words and the self created Afrikaans words, but I don't really have Turkey's words. Maybe, but it's dual use, but mostly Malay words and Arabic words in, in the book. You'll see. No. Marv? No, not much. Mostly, mostly the, 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 the Malays, the early Malays, Malaya people, there's not so much Turkish and very little. No, I don't know anything about Turkish. There's no Turkish words in this thing, in this book. Only mostly Malay and Arabic words. That's the lone words that, that's in this book. Yeah, okay. Thank you for those uh, questions. I think let me just come back to the very last uh, lady who just. Uh, this day is. is um, well, I don't, because you didn't come here to talk about me and my family, but my father was apprehended on this day in May 1969. And as a result, yes, it, it sort of, uh, it's something that sort of remains very much etched in our memory. And this was also the day of uh, Milad Nabi, you know, on a Wednesday, if we uh, reflect back. But I mean, let's sort of leave that. I think just coming back to the sort of the, the important questions, uh, let me start with the the Hilmi's question, and that is that when our Bakr Fendi came here, who was here, basically? Dominantly Malay, African-speaking community. And so no ways can somebody who comes from the Ottoman Empire, who is one individual, there might have been two or three, maybe others who came subsequently, but in no way can they have any linguistic effect, so to speak, on the host community. And the host community was already in a process of giving Afrikaans a sort of dimension that others never ever thought would happen. And so this Ajami, Arabic Afrikaans, Ajami, as we would sort of uh, describe it as, basically continues. And as a result, it had the opposite effect on Abu Bakr. He had to learn Afrikaans. He had to become familiar with the Malayu. And he himself, by the way, was a linguist because he was uh, pretty au okay with other languages at the time from where he came. So when he landed up here, he had to now fit into a community that was literally Afrikaans oriented in terms of their, of course, Muslim, which was a common to him, but he also was out of sync with the madhab, with the school of thought. He was Hanafi as opposed to the Shafi'i. So in this way, he was himself influenced by the milieu of his time. So when one talks about any language, any words, it is very unlikely that a uh, Turkish word would have been picked, sort of been, been sort of uh, taken as a loan word into the dominant language. Coming to the first question, and I think it's a very um, challenging task to move in between the two. Uh, it takes time, 
uh, I think even if one can talk about our generation who entered into university, teaching at the university, we had no mentors where you can say, look here, this is how you should go about in your academic sort of career. We had to learn by trial and error. So in a sense, the generation that came after us who entered universities, they had the opportunity to be mentored by others to say, this is what happens in the academia. This is the politics of academia. This is what you should avoid and this is what you should, in order to move up the ladder. So there are these dimensions to it. But having that being a side note, coming back to the shift, I think uh, it, it is a challenging one, but uh, it, you're right. I think one can, and I think this is where the first one connects with the last uh, question, that is to make that sort of, uh, that crossover, to put it that way, is that there are some of us who are skilled in sort of doing that. And I think we should encourage those who basically, for example, uh, into children's literature to try and see what can they do with Muhammad Alexander's book and write a few stories, children's stories, to basically convey those, that culture, those set of ideas, those set of sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the heritage through these particular publications. And I think that can happen. You can do it through pure writing sort of of these, but also in cartoon form. In other words, you can think of different forms. After all, we have different uh, social media platforms through which it can be taken up in different ways. But again, there are individuals in our community who should really take that up. And there are some who are cartoonists, some who are basically children uh, uh, sort of uh, writers. And then of course you have the others basically who write in a more academic way, taking these very ideas that we have here. So when we look at uh, Muhammad Alexander's contribution, we say, well, this is what he collected. What can't we, creative writers, non-creative writers, uh, non-fiction writers, do what, what he has can? I'm, I'm quite certain that somebody will come up and say, okay, let's look at what he had listed. Let's see the gaps. Let's see what, how it can be done. So there are ways of sort of making that crossover. But again, it will need a team of individuals. Uh, Individuals, of course, but sometimes teamwork is also a good work, like we saw in the case of Umar Amir and, and Muhammad basically teaming up. He's editing, he's writing, and I think that is the way to go in order to really to make that sort of lasting contribution. But again, it will take time. It's not something that comes overnight. Uh, it's with experience, with insight, with, you know, with the baggage of information that you have that you have to uh, collect. But I think it can be done, but we as families, as fathers and parents, mothers need to encourage that amongst our children and, and others, of course, not only in our circles, but elsewhere too, uh, because in this way we can appreciate the, this sort of language in a totally different way. But the opportunity is there, it is not to say it's not there, but we need to grab it sort of with both hands. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm, I've just got one person at the back. I've got a comment in front here. Oh, and then Dr. Rhoda there will be the last person. So um, start with a, co a comment. The lady at the back, she can make her way to the front. And then um, we will have uh, Doc Rhoda. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Selamat sore. Semuanya. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Let me take this opportunity first of all to congratulate Dr. Muhammad Alexander and to celebrate his initiative of this book and bringing it to life. For me, it does not only represent the revival of a particular vernacular which existed amongst us as, as Cape or Cape Malay or Cape Muslim community, but it's also the strengthening of a culture. And I want to demonstrate why I say what I'm saying. I was fortunate to have grown up within a Malay-speaking family. And so these words, I'm very familiar with all of these words, but particular, if I look at words, and if I look at 
how language is culture bound. We find, for example, a word like tremakasi. All of us know this word. All of us, all of us supposedly understand the meaning of it as well. But if you really look at this word and the meaning, if you look at trima, trima is to receive. And kasi, if I, if I say, for example, now, saya cinta padamu anda kasihku saya, I love you and kasihku saya, you are my beloved, you are my love. So, trima is to receive and kasi is with love and affection. So in that expression in itself, we see a, 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 a type of culture coming to the fore. We see that warmth. We see that closeness of people. And in particular also, if we look at District 6, and as it was known at the time as Kanala Dorp, and if you look at the word Kanala, Karna, Karna, Allah. Because of Allah. Whatever we do, it is for the sake of Allah. And so there is a certain spirit prevalent amongst the people as they use these words. And this is, this is something that we say to, should take cognizance of. And for the young sister that asked now, how would it be possible for us to bring it back? Don't force our children to use it. It's not going to work. Let us try and re-enchant them with a contribution that was made by our forefathers. Re-enchanting them, making them to love it. They want to use it. There's a certain way in which I was probably um, initiated or made to love Bahasa Malayu. It was because of music. Music singing songs within our, within our household. And so it, it was attractive to the ear. And I made effort to go and study the language. And so for me, Buddha Muhammad, congratulations. Baya Salamat. Baya Salamat. And, and it, it is for sicker that as we take na the publication in ons try om to understand what I'm geskryf is, shall it Die liefde bring in ons harte weer vir mekaar as ons het gebruik, soos het gebruik was destijds. Ek hoop dat die gentleman verstaan, daar was een tyd toe ek een presentation doen in Stellenbosch, jare terug in die 1990s. En ek doen een presentation op Arabic Afrikaans vir die professore daar van die universiteit van Stellenbosch. En ons gebruik nog die overheid projecte met die transparenties and ek gooi het so op die mier, en dis Arabic, en die professors, hulle sit daar, en hulle kyk, en ek begin lees, en dis Afrikaans, en ek is klaar, en die MC vraag vir hulle enige vraag, en amal sit stil, en hulle kyk vir my aan, en die MC sê, meneer, meneer Rakib, ek dink die mense moet huis toe gaan, hulle moet het eerste gaan digest, voordat hulle kan enigheid vraag, want dit is jyltemal iets vreemds vir hulle, Hopelijk, het ons een goeie middag gehad, ons kon mekaar verstaan. Terima kasih sekali lagi, terima kasih banyak. Ya, baik, Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Now that, that, that's quite animated for a moment there. I think we need to wrap up now because it's becoming, it's becoming really, it's, a, it's one of the best. Okay, over to the lady of the year. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and salam to Buddha Muhammad and I want to recommend Buddha Muhammad on uh, memorializing this book because I think I don't think we actually realize the far reaching effects of this book for the future and um, the potential of the book as well and I was very excited to come here to, to meet and speak to Buddha Muhammad alhamdulillah because I was just thinking that I deal with a lot of um, non-Muslims as well. And you always just think, they're just not going to get you. They're just not going to get your type, you know. And we don't realize how it actually translates into not just Muslims as Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. Because, you know, like, I was very excited firstly because, like, when I first learned words of, we're going to jalang by the merang and what are we talking about? And I was eager to learn more. But even when you look at the non-Muslims, when they're saying stuff like kanala, like your uncle mentioned, in fact, in fact, this is a form of da'wah, this book, if you think, because now they're saying something in the name of Allah. They don't even know that they're saying it, but they're mentioning Allah's name. 
So this is actually, and you don't know what kanala, what salamat, what salam, because they actually putting salam on us. With everybody, the non-Muslims, you go anyway. They know already because somebody, or, or somebody, ufa, then they tell me, alhamdulillah. And this is not even Muslim people. So it's amazing what us just reviving this can do and just repeat, repeating, repeating, repeating. And now it's accessible to a lot of people. So I think Uncle Muhammad did a really, really, really good job. And I like to add that Allah just increased this book and lots of people read the book, inshallah. And now for our last uh, speaker, we are handing it over to. So, uh, Dr. Rauda came all the way from Somerset West, and it was not. Uh, and 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 really, but Alhamdulillah is here. The man is 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 clocking 83, 84, something around. No, no, no. I'm not going to say anything. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Goedemiddag, dames en heren. Het is voor mij een groot plezier en een genot om deel te wezen aan die prachtige geleentheid. En dan wil ik voor meneer Alexander 100% feliciteren met die wonderwerk wat hij verricht heeft. Dat is ons taal Afrikaans. Ik lees zo graag naar RSG. But I want to say this. There will be diverse views on how to implement these things in the community. You can be sure of that. But there are ways and means to start in a small way. And if we look at our community radios over the years, who brought in the word from Shukran and Magbara, and plus from Kubas and Tramakasi, start with your radio presenters to sort of weave these words into your presentations and your programs that you have. That's one way to start. Secondly, we cannot allow that this hard work that Muhammad did should go wasted. Try to, to raise a, a sort of a fund so that these books can be given free to our madaris, to our teachers, so they can use those words in the lessons that they give, including the cartoons to, to which uh, Professor uh, Harun refers to. There are ways and means. It's difficult to bring back something that's in the past. It's difficult. But there are ways if you start in a small way. And inshallah, I make dua that these suggestions will be taken up by the people who are involved in the media, that we can try and slowly introduce these words back into our community. Muhammad for the wonder work with Jay One final, one final wrap up. Muhammad Alexander, I just want to say. On behalf of Mannenberg High, we are very proud of you as an ex Mannenberg student and ex Muslim student. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Muhammad Arun, Abu Abdullah. Abu Abdullah, how is the situation? It's a good time, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to have a handover. Um, the author has got two books that he would love to hand over, and that is the one is going to be Ms. Manir Michael Jonas. He is from the Afrikaans Tal Rad in, 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 in what's your name? In the Tal Museum. In the Tal Museum. So, it is a basis of the word of the Tal Rad. We gaan elke keer. Kan ons net een beetje voor en te kom, basis, mensen van die press, as we even wil foto's neem, kan we, waar die camera mensen, what um uh, uh Conrad Stienkamp just wants to give sort of uh, an uh, uh an abbreviation of uh, his presence here today and the organizations uh, that he's uh, representing here. Thank you. Bain Tramakasi. I thought I should just clarify a few details. One, Michael Jonas is the executive director of the Tal Monument, Afrikaans Tal Monument in, in, in the Perl. They have a, a big event today, 
with uh, people demonstrating, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, about a proposed change about the pro proposal to change the name of the monument and removing the word Afrikaans. That is why he can't be here, and he asked me to receive the book on his behalf. He's very sorry that he can't be here in person. Um, I am the executive head of the Afrikaans Language Council. And I'll give, a, just, I'll give a short explanation as to what that is. Michael Jonas is the chairperson of my board of directors. So that is why I'm here. He asked me to represent him. Um, so I'm very glad that I can receive this on his behalf and on the behalf of his, of his colleague. Um, if, if, could I just say something about what I've experienced here about the... Hmm? In Afrikaans, no good. I must say, this book let me opgewonden feel. The Afrikaans taalraad bevorder Afrikaans in sy volle diversiteit. Ons is ook betrokken by sogenaamde Muslim Afrikaans of Arabisch Afrikaans, hier kan die nuances nog vir mens verduidelik, Ons ondersteun die program Barakat by Radio 786. Dit is eerste zondag van elke maand, behalve gedurende Ramadan. Zondagmiddag hier vijf uur, half zes, zes uur, vijf uur, zes uur, zes kant rond. Um, met Fatima Ali as, as die programleier. Ons werk saam met Litnet, wat toenemend onderhoude en materiaal oor die moslimgemeenskap en kwesties van belang vir die moslimgemeenskap kan die mens aanlijn by Litnet gaan kry. Wat die rede kom hierdie mel het opgewonde voel het is you are busy with language revitalization. En wat die skrywer daar gesê het is uiterst belangrijk. Die belangrijkste ding is mens moet die woorde gebruik. En mens moet het oordra na die kinders toe. So Ons is baie opgewonde daar ek is baie opgewonde daar en ek wil sal baie graag met die professore en so ook verder wou praat hierover en sien of ons kan help, of daar ondersteuning is wat ons vir mekaar kan geen, of jylle ook ons gesprekke kan verrijk. Baie dankie. So now we, the, the first handover that will, will take place will be that to... Mr. Michael Jonas. Sorry. <laughs> Tal Monument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then the second one will go to, and the winner is. Mr. Say Brandis. And that's for the Tal Museum. Yeah. Wh whilst we're there, um, I have to give to uh, Professor Harun, he's going to do the the officiating now, while I take his place and he must come to the front. Okay, I wait man over the volgende. Yeah. Namens the Afrikaans Taalraad, I would like to hear the two books in the bibliotheek. Oh, bye, thank you. Yeah, we are very happy. Bye, thank you. Baie dank vir die. Ek denk die, ja, die eerste boek is die Encyclopedia of Islam. It was edited a while ago, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just trying to recall the name. I've seen the publication. It's an edited work by, sorry, just hang on. Yeah, sort of classer. It was done sort of a while ago. And it's a very useful encyclopedia in terms of terminology, in terms of historical events and so forth. So indeed, I think uh, it will be very useful for 
researchers uh, who want to look up and look at certain terms. The second one is something, of course, we are familiar with the uh, translation of, uh, of Sheikh Yusuf Ali's uh, work. It has been translated, or rather, it has been reprinted in, at different stages in history since the time it appeared. But this specific one uh, was published by King Abdulaziz, uh, King Fahad uh, Holy Quran Foundation. And what is interesting about this, uh, as a matter of uh, some might not know, uh, the, this commentary was re-edited, which personally I don't like, but nonetheless, because you do not interfere in somebody else's commentary, you leave it as is. But be that as it may, interestingly, one South African from the Cape had a hand in it. Uh, those who know Dr. Awakar Wakir, who went to teach at, uh, at the uh, university in Jeddah, uh, King Abdulaziz, he has, was part of that committee that basically uh, did the sort of re-editing of the commentary. So uh, again, we welcome these type of contributions uh, because, I mean, there are other maybe um, sort of additions of it, but again, this makes it unique partly because of that South African finger in the translation. And I think that is something that we need to uh, also appreciate. So thank you very much. We very much appreciate it. Uh, uh, do appreciate these, and I think we appreciate any other, uh, if I may, uh, Mr. MC, and of course, our MC used to be with Timbuktu, which we very sad he had closed down or whatever happened there, but he's been here now, so I think he welcomes any contribution, isn't it? Absolutely. So anyone with any contribution of any book, please hand it over to him. Not formally like this, but next time informally. I'm sure you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you very much to Conrad. Um, bye, 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 donkey. On sal tamelijk dit is on sal het op te spleet, on sal het gebruik, on sal het uitreik, on sal het op ons populist het op Facebook en so. Ek hoop dat in die in 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 die toekomst sal ons meer naan mekaar trek en en werk te saam. Dis baie dinge wat ek glorie taal raad kan doen vir die bibliotheek. En ek denk as baie dinge wat ek, wat ek denk die bibliotheek kan doen vir die taalraad. So ek vraag, laat ons miskien net so klein gesels hier daarna. Um, I head, I'm, I'm the head of libraries at uh, academia. Um, my, I am to facilitate, I am to facilitate um, all operational matters um, inside the library. I would like everybody to become part. This is a public library. It's a public space. It is not an exclusive entity of some entity. It is a very, very public library. What makes it exciting is, is that we, we are independently funded. So we go out to people and say, come, come and support this cause. Come and see what it is that we are doing. We are currently stocked in with approximately 15, 18, 18,000 titles, and there's room for much more. So I want to thank each and everybody here today. Have I left anybody out? Not at all. I want to thank everybody else from, from, from my management, my staff, my volunteers, people behind the scenes, um, Rafika Phillips that has been calling around doing this, doing that. I want to thank everybody for, for, for bringing this together, making this day a success, a, a resounding success. I think a lot of people has been asking me over the last few days, what is, this, what is this book launch all about? And I said, come. If you can't come, we will be streaming it. But the support out here on this very, very wet, cold Saturday afternoon in, or in the heart, not in the heart of winter yet, but almost there, I want to thank each and everybody. I'm going to ask... Um, Oh, what does he word for the people? Did he buy any money? 
the buya, the punky. Thank you for our. I'm going to ask him to make a closing du'a um, and uh, also just to um, say a word of thank you as well from the uh, everybody at Al Ikhlas Academia Library. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. What is the other thing? There's a Twitter and there's and WhatsApp, you can join the WhatsApp library. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to make dua and we're going to ask the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the gathering here today, that he bless this gathering, that he allow us to leave from this gathering uh, with his peace and that uh, we should not be amongst the wretched people living or walking the face of this earth and they must accept from us in all humility we turn unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen Sayyidina wa Nabiyina wa Mawlana Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi azma'in Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا مدرودا ولا شقيا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصل اللهم وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين. Terima kasih ya, terima kasih. Um, the, there's some refreshments um, that was uh, that's outside. Please have something, have a bottle of water, and um, the book signing, the book signing will will take place now. Thank you.